fill in my size 6 shoes with these size 12s. <laughs> and I've got my daughter, Karen Lone Elk. Uh, she'll also be assisting my son. When I finally step away from what I'm doing, it's been a little, you know, many, many years that I've been with Running Strong. I want to thank Richard for saying a beautiful prayer. And as we go, uh, I teach, I really tell my family, I believe in who we are as Lakota. We are Lakotas. Uh, I use the term Kahanshi and Hakashi a lot. That's respect for my connection with my, my, my fellow relatives. And as we say in Lakota, you know, we are all related, Mitapio Yasi. And I mean it when I say that, you know, and the real term of that is I could speak about all day, but I won't. But my hair is for running strong. Um, it goes back to, and um, I used to work for the Department of Energy out of Pier. Uh, and I, I was working on some houses in Slim Buttes area. And as I used to go by there every day, the I, I noticed where Nacha, Chief Oliver Red Cloud, lives out there going to Slim Buttes, I noticed a group of men trying to build a log house. And uh, being a carpenter, I'm, I'm a carpenter, I'm a journeyman carpenter, and I've uh, done many construction sites around here, but I, I, I noticed that, and it used to bother me. Uh, I noticed that they'd be milling around there, but never, nothing ever, never seen anything going up. It'd go up so far and come back down and restart. So one day I stopped in there, offered my assistance, and I met some people there and some guys I knew, some men I knew are no longer walking on this earth. But I, I asked them, you know, and I volunteered my efforts uh, as a carpenter. I, I showed them how to start the, the log house, how to square it up and start the walls, and we did that. That one day there ended up, I ended up the whole house myself. <laughs> but I, I built that whole house for not just Oliver Red Cloud, as you see it, it's by his, it's a log house uh, by, um, by Oliver Red Cloud's uh, residence there, we're going to Slim Buttes, still standing. Uh, that was constructed probably about 1984, somewhere around there. I did everything, um, the handsaw, I did cut, did all the cutting with the handsaw and from that. And from that point on, there's a, probably about November, October, November, about this time of the year. I was working on that house by myself with a friend of mine, and he was assisting me. And a, a, a tour bus pulled in. A group of individuals came. And I was trying to get the roof covered before it snowed, before it snowed. And, um, and this blanket, the way they were putting this over this morning, the towel I was putting this over there, brought me back to that time. As, as I was up on the roof, I was up on the wall, getting the rafters ready. Uh, this young, this old elderly gentleman came and kept uh, putting this star quilt over that wall and it blew off. It was a windy, cold day, just like yesterday. And, and it kept blowing off, so I helped him. and got a nail, put it down, put it down. But from there, and then, and then, uh, we were doing that, and I, I, I first uh, I asked him, I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I, and he didn't really introduce, we didn't, in, introduce each other, which was you know, a big mistake on my part. I said, I'm trying to finish this house, and, and he said, well, I just did a little minute, a minute or two. And so I stopped, let it go, and helped him. And this group of people got off the bus, and they were all in there, and they were talking, but uh, at that time, you know, I, I'd never really thought nothing of it, so I took that time away to go drink some coffee and sit there and visit with my uh, my guy that was assisting me. But about a week or two later, Tom Cook called me. He said, uh, that old man from, you was chewing out, he said, I wants to talk to you. Oh, oh, I said, I'm gonna probably get sued or something, I thought, you know. And um, it turned out that it was Mr. Eugene Krizak, the founder of Christian Relief Services at that time, as it was known. Uh, that's the mother organization, Christian Relief Services. And uh, him and I start talking, that would have been about 83, 84, somewhere around there. And he said he wanted to meet me and visit with me more because of my, of what I did for that house. 
Then about in March of that year, that, that year, he, uh, he, Gene came over. I called him Gene, you know, and um, that's how we got to know each other. And from that time on, from that brief visit and that brief time there, Gene and I developed a, a friendship and a bond. We started talking about the needs of the Oglala Yata. And that summer, uh, my father-in-law, Joe American Horse, uh, my wife's uncle, he um, was the chairman of the tribe. And Gene, Gene at the Pawa, at the Wachipi, at the, uh, at the present Pawa grounds that we have now, they were having a Wachipi there and they, they met they met there. I think that was where it was at, but I'm not too sure where the exact location was, but it was one of the Wachipis we had. And Gene asked Joe, the chairman, he said, what do your fam what do your people need? We can try to help you, try to assist your your, your people. And uh, Joe, without skipping the beat, said water. He said, we need water. That's how Christian Relief Service started the WOW program. And, and in this book, I wish I wished I had uh, more of these, but I, I never really realized I was coming here to do this presentation. I would have got, got had more of these. If you get a chance to look at uh, thumb through this. But it was in um, 1987, Running Strong drilled its first water well on Pine Ridge. That's when the water wells kicked off on here through my father-in-law Joe's request for, for water. From that point is how Running Strong came into play. But at that time, it was, again, it was like it was Christian Relief Services when I was volunteering with them. And, and Running Strong actually began in 1986 with Billy Mills. That's when Billy Mills and Gene Kreczak partnered up. And, and from that point on, through Billy's dreams and his his story of, of Billy's, of, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever listened to Billy's uh, presentations, but really gives some powerful presentations. Uh, I really lis enjoy listening to him because I, I, I've, it's every story just drives that energy into me. But from that point on is how we actually started Running Strong, was from Gene through Billy. And that's how we got to where we're at today. And as my, uh, you know, as, as all these years I was with Running Strong, it was always a volunteer because I have, as I said, I have many relatives in the districts, many relatives, blood relatives on my mother's, my mother's side, my father's side, my wife's side and her father, and et cetera, how, to, how, to, how we were related. So I have relatives, blood relatives in every district, every district. And how I really got involved with them was through my work with the DEO Department of Energy out of Pier. I used to weatherize, they call it. Uh, I used to um, work on houses, mobile homes, many things that, that we did. And I used to put windows in, fix the glass and doors and whatnot, just to keep the wind out, keep the heat in. And that's how we got, how I got involved through that. To running strong was was my connection through them, and I used to running through running strong's funding, and the DOE we got to start partnering up, been doing 50-50 where I got whatever the figure whatever the dollar amount I had for the budget year, I doubled that through running strong, so we actually did twice twice the amount of work for the for the families on Pine Ridge. It's been with that, it, it, there are so many things that we've done to Running Strong. The, the, the gift, I think the, um, the gift that the Running Strong gave the Lakota Oyate was their belief in us, their belief in my recommendations, their belief in the, the Lakotas. We are probably the only nonprofit that's totally managed by Lakotas. 
we do the selections. We don't, we don't choose who gets what. And it's another story that my son will get into. But what we do is that uh, from ideas, and I listen to everyone I'm out, while I'm out there, especially to the homeowners, the Ushika people. The Ushika ones are the ones I really try to touch. They're the first, my first priority, the Ushika people. The ones I have don't have what we, what we enjoy going home to. So that's my priority is the Ushika people. Those are the ones I touch base with. I know a lot of families. You know, and, and with that, uh, it, it's um, how we developed all these different little programs from Running Strong. Then how, where the food bank, we used to have a food bank, and how that ended, and how my son started. But that's his, he will talk about that when I finish here. But with this, with with their funding and what I saw out there, being out there a lot, out in the districts a lot, is that in my in my line of work, you know, I I, I, I designed uh, handicap ramps. I don't like to call them handicap ramps, and it's not that's not the real term for it. I shouldn't be using it, but uh, it, it's ramps, and I called them entrance modifications. And those were some of them. I, I've seen some ramps that my God, be uh, ski jumps, man. They, all over, you know. <laughs> but uh, what I designed, what I designed, and was for my cousin first. Her name was Margaret Cooney, Margie Cooney. Uh, she's my first cousin, and, and she she didn't want a ramp, even though she needed one. She wasn't in a wheelchair; she was in a walker. So I sat there and we visited. And what I did, I designed the steps, was four four inches, but it was there were thirty two inch treads. 32 inches this way, where she actually could pick her walker up and take a step. And that's what she did, and that's how many of these HUD homes have those from my design. And I won an award, actually, from Minnesota for that design, but, you know, I never talk about it. And I'm just me, just something I happened on to. But that's with the entrance modification that I've, I've taught. My, my a lot of lot of young men to build. Because I, I, I I'm scared of ramps in the winter time. I, I'm really scared of ramps in the winter time. I'm scared and I, I don't like to build them unless I have to. And that's where that, that entrance modification came in, where it's easier to come down in a circle because everything's in a circle. But anyway, that's uh, that's one of the things that we've done. That's the beauty of working with Running Strong is their belief in what we did out there is for, for the people. Everything we've done, everything I've done is for the people, is for the Ushika people. Those are the ones I think about a lot. Uh, we've, um, we've done so many things, you know, that that's, um, I, I was thinking about this and I never really didn't know I was going to make this presentation to such a dignified, intelligent group. I, uh, you know, it's, it's humbling for me to be speaking in front of my friends there. Ed, you know, Ed's a good friend of mine. I went to high school with him. And uh, Richard, Mr. Means. Mr. Means, uh, Russell's a good, real good friend of mine. And Ted, not him personally. But, uh, but it, it, it's these things that I have I've, was going to say, all, it was all up here, this, 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 and this. But <laughs> up here, and I guess I'm not very, uh, I'm not a good communicator in front of everyone. Uh, I'm, I've always considered myself a guy that likes to think and do the work, you know, and I'm, I, I'm a quiet person, really fairly quiet, and, uh, but I've done many, many things with Running Strong. Uh, the, the dialysis clinic, I, I and uh, another gentleman put the first dialysis clinic on any reservation in the United States at Porcupine. The Porcupine was the first one to receive a dialysis clinic. Then from that, Running Strong helped fund the other, the large dialysis clinic at Pine Ridge. Then from Running Strong also back in the early 80s, we were the first to contribute to, the, to fundraising for the Sioux Ann Center. 
we were the first one to. I think they um, they gave they donated two hundred eighty thousand to the Sioux Ranch Center to get them started. Uh, we've helped so many different agencies, many things. The gift, you know. Some of the things that uh, one of the that I'll touch on here is I, I know I'm kind of going all over, but uh, 1997, when uh, uh, I think we start losing funding at the tribal level, and what I sensed, and I think a lot of you can um, agree with me on that, or I've never ever received anything from the tribe in sense of of funding, because they said I was always over income. Here I had the worst car in the reservation, and <laughs> but I think many of you have probably experienced that, you know, apply for certain things and be over income. Uh, my daughters were that way because we're a small family. I only have three daughters and one son, and they only, each one of my children have two, two children, so they um, were almost over income. So back in 1997, I was visiting with Paul Trezak, Jeannie's son, and we talked about the hardships during the winter months and the funding cycle of, of, the, of, the, of the, how the U.S. government's funding cycle works. And that's how I came up with the, that heat match, heat match proposal that I've developed that's still going today. And my daughter and Dave, I turned that over to them. But that's a heat match, $100 for your $100 and how it started. Back then, uh, you know, in the, the, all the years I've worked with Running Strong, never, uh, I was just thinking about this yesterday, how large our, our tribal population has grown since the 80s. I, I used to run the whole nine districts by myself as a volunteer while I was working. And now it takes three of us, uh, and it's jumped, and I look back, my God, I said, there's, there's no 15, 15,000, I think I always see different things. There's about 50, 60,000 of us. In <laughs> and if you travel around with me, you'll see what I mean. All the, you go from Manderson, you go to Manderson Road, and you go north. I never realized how many houses are out there. The different people that's on there move back, the young people that move back. Just in my Teoshpaya, where we got the building, I was the first one to move back out there. That's my mother's land that I inherited. And I moved back. Now there's 14 houses out there, 14 houses. There's 44 voters out there. We got a full voting block, but we never vote. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, that, that's, those are the things you look around and see that all over. I was coming back from Red Cloud Indian School. My son and I was coming back. From his, I was showing him that road. I saw where uh, my cola lives out there. Jeez, he's got a, a ranch out there. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I do a lot of traveling, and I do a lot for running strong. I've seen everything, I'm aware of everything. The comments I receive from, from, from individuals, what they need, so it, it, it's, um, we're really in, in, we have a unique relationship with our relatives out in the districts, all nine districts. We, um, we got another historic meeting. This is really historic of what I'm doing today. It's the first time I'm ever making a presentation for our Oyate, for the Glala Oyate. I really want to thank OLC for allowing us to do this. And, 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 and there are so many things that we're doing next week, or I think it's next week, November 1st, is another historical event for us where, because our building has, was enlarged. Uh, now we're, we, um, we're going to be meeting with the all nine district chairman, one, co one, one representative, council representative, and the district uh, service coordinator. And we're going to inform them of all the things that we have, all the applications we have for water connections. The water connections, we don't drill anymore, so we do water connections. But all those applications we have that we, we, we um, uh, you know, sometimes we just, it just doesn't get out there enough. Uh, we really look forward to that meeting with all the district people and utilizing the district 
service coordinators, how much knowledge they have. They know their people. They know their people, you know, and um, this, this is how we, what we do with our running strong with uh, all the different individuals and different families. We've done many projects on this reservation, and every one of my projects, if we have, we don't bid it out. I go to individual contractors that I know that used to work for me when I was at the housing authority, and all my contractors are, lo are local people, are, 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 are Lakota contractors. I've used uh, Rusty Puckett's group, I've uh, got Francis Ferguson, Mike Ferguson, Sam O'Rourke, uh, the list goes on of all our contractors, all the individuals that work for us. We've had, um, we, sometimes we use a contractor once a year, but at least they give that contractor at least something to look forward to. Bam Brewer worked for us. There are so many guys that work for us that do things for us, but we reach out to everyone. We have, through Running Strong, we have a very, very strong working relationship with all the individual different entities that that um, that are on this on, on our on our homeland. I work very closely with James Begaman. Uh, he's an environmental um, engineer that I work with on our water water connection project that I'll get into here. Work with uh, different entities, but all these different people that that help us. The the. All the organizations that have assist the tribal members, we have a very good work work and relationship with them. They uh, they believe in us and they really help us. We've never really bumped heads with anyone. They've always been grateful. We've always been grateful for their assistance. You know, going back to again, like I said, I didn't put anything in front of me, but going back to the water water issue. <laughs> And you're smiling and goes, that's good. <laughs> Just, hey, hey, because my son used to do that. <laughs> but anyway, but, uh, so if I said water wells, we did water wells. And we did $4.8 million worth of um, water wells donations for the Glala, for the Glala people, for the Glala families. There's, out of those 485 families, there's only one water well that didn't hit water, but we've had 99 and 9900% success in our water wells. Uh, we um, going through American Horse Creek. Up there's a, a family, I think it's a Clifford family, uh, that lives way up in the hill. Uh, I didn't think my driller would get up there, but he went up there, got it, and we hit water up on the hill. So we've, we've hit water everywhere except up on Richard Table, which where, the, where we had a, we couldn't hit water. But we've had water, we drilled water wells in Slim, uh, Long Valley, Wombly, you name it, we've been there. We've drilled water wells all over. Then in the several years back, the water tests were really coming back negative for our groundwater. Uh, and right now we're doing some 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 of them that have arsenic in them in their in their wells. Uranium, lead. There's heavy metals. Um, but based on that, I was listening to my father-in-law and Tom Cook do a presentation on Kili Radio about how much contaminated wells there was, how what was going on. But from that point on, because I was I was the main person that was doing the water wells, that I put a stop to it. And that's when my son was start working for us. So we sat there and visited it, and I talked to different individuals across the reservation. And it was a hard thing to stop because it was a free well for families. And my son, you know, is when, when he first started, came, when he came on board, I used to sit there and mope around, nothing to do. <laughs> he said, why don't you keep Grandpa Joe's um, dream of life? Uh, I sat there and looked at him and said, dream of life? Yeah, I said, just keep on giving water. So let's use Mini Wichoni. And that's where that little T-shirt that uh, comes out there and, and you know, and a lot of, where water is life. So we've done, I started working with the world water staff and think, you know, I used to work for them too. I used to be a, a computer operator for the uh, world water staff when we first started. But I met with Willard Clifford and all the different inspectors and Chuck Jacobs and uh, Pope Means was still a director back then. 
and they all welcomed us in here because their, their funding was going down. Uh, I, I guess Running Strong was um, a blessing at that time when, when their funding was going down, we, we stepped in. So we, have in, so we work with the real water staff and Indian Health Service, the water people that do the connections. From that point on, uh, and when we, we found out that all this tests were coming up, we start doing the water connections program. So we started with Francis because Francis Ferguson worked with um, the real water people, at many of the people, um, and Kyle for many years is uh, really knowledgeable about where all the water lines are, so I started with him. We did a test uh, pilot project. We did a pilot project with two contractors. Uh, Washitu contractor and Lakota contractor, and uh, and we did five apiece. And the Lakota contractor finished his in two weeks, and the other guy was busy moving around with whatever. But and that's how we started with with Francis Ferguson, and then now we got Sam O'Rourke and you know, and other guys that want to want to be part of the program. But. From that point on was when we, we stopped drilling water wells, we went into using the Minnewichoni water line, the real water line. And that's safe, that's safe water, you know, and there's, um, I drink it, my family drinks it. Um, but there's that, but anyway, there's, that's brief, I guess, you know, I'm, I what I've, um, from my beginnings with Running Strong, what all I've done constructed houses, I've done little of everything. If there's a, I guess right now, I um, want to um, ask and leave it open to you guys, anyone has any questions about running strong, I might have forgotten. And like I said, I did get a chance to prepare because I was busy with my waterline people. <laughs> but if anyone has any questions, you know there's, yes. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody realized that there's a web page yes. that you guys have, and it um, details everything, so many things that you guys do, the activities and, and so on and so forth. So I, I want to make sure that everybody knew that you can go to Running Strong, and I think it's .com, is it, son? Dot .org. Indianyouth.org. Indianyouth.org. Okay, so I wanted to make sure that that got out, and then um, <coughs> all the many things that you brought today, and and um, your your dedication and everything. We just are very honored to have you here. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. And and um, this painting uh, of Billy, he's a veteran, as you all know, he's a Marine veteran. We donated this to um, to the college. That uh, I won it put it in Michelle's, um, in this this building because he is a veteran, he's a Lakota veteran. And, uh, but it was really supposed to go to Rose Fraser's program, but <laughs> she, she, she supported me and let me donate it here, so. So this is for, there is um, um, a booklet, I, I don't know if my son wants to do it or he wants me to do it, but it, there's a booklet that des describes the whole painting, uh, Pat, Pat Mills, Patricia Mills, uh, paint it, what, what she saw in Billy, and I guess uh, maybe I should just go ahead and do it Sunday. you want me to do it or you want to do it? Which one? Uh, just uh, read that for that painting. Oh, oh yes, yes. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, I just have a quick question. Did you say you do solar? Pardon me? Do you do solar? Is yeah. that what I heard you say? Something about no, solar? No, not yet. Oh, We're okay. exploring that. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't get into anything unless I'm really, it's not going to hurt my people. That's, I make sure it's, um, it's safe for my people and affordable, and we don't uh, put a burden on them financially. Is that solar? I mean, I when I, I when I first got into solar way back in the 80s, just the battery was almost $500, and it took eight of those batteries. It was enough money for about four years of, Lake Creek Bill. <laughs> but anyway, that was a long time ago. I uh, uh, briefly, if you uh, excuse me, I, I um, read the statement, artist statement of Patricia Mills of a, a painting of Billy here. 
uh, when I was asked to do a painting of Billy by Running Strong for American Indian Youth to, commemor to commemorate the 50-year anniversary of Billy's race at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics, I wanted to depict the impact that Running Strong and Billy have had on Indian reservations in America. Water is life, and for the past 28 years, Running Strong had provided water wells on Indian reservations as well, as well as many other services. Billy's message is one of health and wellness for Native people, and since water is paramount to life and health, I chose to depict water as one of the central themes of this painting. Through the thousands of supporters, Running Strong has been able to provide this valuable resource. The blue rectangles you see on the left side of the painting are symbolic of the thousands of supporters Running Strong has had in helping provide these water wells. I have used the Olympic rings in this painting to launch, symbolically, the provision of water for the reservation. This water, in turn, is falling and connecting with the supporters in the blue squares, thus completing a circle sacred to the Lakota and other tribal nations. You'll see the yellow ring is reminiscent of a dream catcher. I really enjoyed doing the actual portrait of Billy. I spent a lot of time on the, on the details of the actual image. The fact that he is gazing directly at the viewer reflects his warmth, compassion, and dedication to community. Got to enjoy, Pat, Pat Mills. And, and it's really a beautiful painting when you look. And I was telling Patricia and, and Tawa that you walk by this, it actually, the eyes actually fall. <laughs> it's a little spooky. <laughs> Go by looking at it. <laughs> but I, I guess that's what I do with Running Strong. Ken, I would like to introduce um, uh, Dr. Frank. Uh, um, She's a strong, well, um, Vice President of um, Instructional Affairs here at OLC, and uh, she has come down to watch the program, and I've asked her if she would, um, could accept um, the, the painting on behalf of OLC, and, um, and then, of course, on behalf of Ken, I just mm -hmm. want to thank him, but um, if you'd like mm -hmm. to say a few words. And, sure. and we just so appreciate it. This is thank thank you. my granddaughter. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Um, I want to um, say a little wopila tonka chicha to Lexi um, Ken and to Running Strong for all the things that they have done uh, for our people. And I know how dedicated and committed uh, uh, Lexi Ken is. And if there's one word that I could describe, it would be humility uh, for our people. And I want to thank all of you for coming here and witnessing this and all the work that he's done and his son and his family. So, wopila. Thank you. Thank you again. Appreciate that. Okay, that's I guess I am, um, but and my little presentation here, and I hope I um, made sense. I'm not a very good speaker, like I said, I'm a carpenter, and I'm out there like he's out. He's always out there, and but I want to thank all of you, uh, and don't be scared to call us. Four five five two nine seven five is our main office. We try to help, we try to reach out to everyone. All of you, everyone is our relative. We'll never forget that. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Again, I'm Dave Lonauk, his boss. <laughs> and his son. I'd like to uh, ask for forgiveness from, for those uh, older than me um, for speaking in front of you. Um, he was right. Uh, we're busy a lot. We have so many things going on in our day-to-day -day operations that we, we hardly get time to do things like this. And I want to take this opportunity to thank um, OLC for inviting us here to speak like this. I do this once a year for our annual tour. Um, it's a tour where we take our donors who donate to the Running Strong organization and we show them all the programs that 
they donate to and how it impacts the reservation, specifically Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, Guala Sioux Tribe, and it is a lot. Um, what we do not do, and people can question this, I know my, my people that, I've, and we're a satellite office here in Pine Ridge. Our main office is located in Alexandria, Virginia. So a lot of, pe a lot of my coworkers and colleagues back there um, question a lot about getting it out there, you know, letting people know what it is we do. And some of you may not even know what it is we do. But we don't, in our office, um, believe in talking about ourselves. Um, I, I, it's, it's like, okay, here's a good example. You put a special on at a powwow. You give an honorarium to the Yapaha to talk for you because you don't like to tell about what you did, all the stuff that you did for the people or the things like that. You don't do, we don't do that. And so we don't get on Keeley as much as we probably should to, to speak about what we do. Um, and it's a lot. And so um, inviting us here to come do this, it, it's a good opportunity for us to explain to you what it is we do. Uh, how many people here by a show of hands knows even the words running strong? Yeah, see, that's about half, about half the people here. Um, we, we believe in humility. And so um, OLC asking us to come speak like this is a good opportunity to let the people know locally that um, we do stuff like the annual heat match, which I'm starting earlier this year. It's, it's a new thing that I'm doing. Uh, our in-kind and, and food distribution, um, our water connection program. And we're, we're ever-changing and we're always evolving and uh, that's something that I pride myself in. Before, right when I started working for Running, I've been working for Running Strong for eight years now. And back then we did a food bank program, or he did at the time. He was volunteering. And um, there, it was something, there was something wrong in my eyes about giving families three-day-old, past the sell-by date, loaves of bread, smashed birthday cakes, um, you know, the stuff that you would get at a food bank. Scrunchies, brushes, combs. You know, you, you can take a case of brushes home, but how are you going to eat that? How are you going to sell it? Who's going to buy it? But people fight for it, you know? And so I had, we had written a grant. I had written a grant to get um, frozen nutritional food. And we're going on, I think this is, this is our eighth year now that we've been distributing food boxes to, we used to do all nine districts. Um, sadly, the, uh, the past f maybe three or four years, we've only been doing four districts. Porcupine, which is the one I manage, uh, where our office is located, Porcupine District, uh, Medicine Root District, Eagle Nest District, and Wakabomini District. And um, the reason why is um, we don't charge people. I don't tell people, you have to pay for this. You need to give me a monthly membership to receive services. He talked about it earlier. Everything that we do, we do for the people, uh, the people who really need it. And I trust the people who come to receive services to be truthful and understanding that if you don't need it, don't take it. Because there's always somebody in the backwoods who lives three miles off the road with you know, no heat, no car, four kids, four children, who needs that box of food or who needs that heat match propane or lights and I put a lot of trust in the, the people and it's been working out so far. Um, so all I ask in return for these services is proof that you've received it. Signatures, that's all I want. I want to be able to track who received a food box, who received the heat match, you know, who received the water connection and that's, that's it. And I know a lot of people are afraid to sign things and this and that, and that's all I ask. See, they ask me for things in Virginia. They ask me for photographs, you know, pictures of children wearing these winter coats, children wearing these snow boots, scarves, stocking caps. I give all this stuff away, blankets, turkeys, food boxes, uh, tennis shoes, pampers, laundry detergent, dental hygiene kits. 
I give all this stuff away, but I don't document who received it, you know, with, with a photograph. I should. I probably should for auditing reasons. But I just ask for their signatures because I don't believe in things like poverty porn. I don't believe in showing the world how pitiful and ushinka we are. Because we are. We are. Not all of us. Don't get me wrong. We're not a beat down third world country like they've portrayed us to be. All of us go to school. We go, we go to college. We work. We do our best. And this is who we are. We're just like the rest of society. And so I don't believe in showing the world those who aren't like the rest of us. Those who can't go to school every day, who can't afford a pair of shoes. And I've seen them. I don't know if you guys seen our people like that, but I've seen them in this position in the past eight years. I've seen children come to my office with no shoes, wearing socks, asking if I had shoes. I've gone out and purchased with my own money shoes for these children. Because at that time, like I said, we're ever evolving and changing. At that time, the only shoes we gave out were for adults. I couldn't, I couldn't give a toddler, I couldn't give a six-year-old girl shoes because we didn't have any. So I went out and bought her shoes, and then I wrote, I wrote it into the next proposal. that the, ne the next year, I wanted more children's shoes, toddler shoes. Now we have that. See? Um, we were giving out jackets, and these were like dark blue, dark green, gray. And so a lot of the kids didn't want them. Because who wants to wear a dark green, who wants, you know, if you're a little girl, you're going to wear a dark blue jacket, a dark green one, or a gray one? You're just not. Um, if you're cold, you will, but, I mean, yeah. come on. I mean, these are children. should be proud to wear a jacket. Yeah. And so now we have winter coats that are pink with purple stripes or lime green with the aqua marine stripe. You know, they're very, very nice jackets. And we have winter kits, too, which includes a stocking cap, a scarf, and gloves. So each child receives a jacket with one of those kits and a, some snow boots. That's another thing that we ask. So we're always evolving, and I'm always asking the people, what do you want? What, what do you want? Don't be afraid to tell me. What can we get? I can ask. It's always, I can always ask. They may say no, or they may say maybe next year. But look, we didn't have shoes for children. We did, definitely never had winter boots, snow boots. We used to have little fleece blankets. Now we have these, he jokes. He jokes about these blankets we got now. He calls them uh, um, smallpox blankets. And they're really thick, nice blankets, really thick. They're really soft, they're not a smallpox. It's just the way they look. They're very big, huge flannel blankets. Uh, but we do give those out. And um, I tell people, you know, if you're not gonna use it to cover up, cover your door with it, because it's a, it's a thick, it's a thick blanket. And uh, I, I have a mobile home. It's not the greatest uh, when it's weatherized. You know, there's still cold drafts that get in through the doors, and I'm sure a lot of us deal with things like that. And these things, I tell people, you can do it with that. You can roll it up, stick it at the bottom of your front door. Draft won't come in. And um, our main focus is the children. So we get, we get these things, and it's, it's, it's always look, we're always looking to make it better for the people. Because at the end of the day, that's what matters to me. Because like I said, I've seen those children barefooted. I seen a little boy come to one of our toy distributions a couple years ago. And um, he, didn't, uh, he didn't get a toy. And so uh, we went out and purchased him one. And uh, called him back and gave it to him. His eyes lit up. And um, it's, those, it's those moments like that where uh, they're sad. And I don't do it because, ah, yeah, you know, my conscience is clear. And, you know, these little kids are, you know, no. These children need these things, and you know that's our youth, that's our future. That's just how I approach my work every day. Uh, I started out as a job. I needed a job. Nine years ago, my daughter was born. She's eight years old now. I was broke. I left my previous job, and so I hastily wrote a grant for food distribution. We got it. I got, we started doing it. I got hired. It went from a job to a career because uh, over the years I started finding out people needed water. People needed septic tanks, which is another thing we're always changing. And so now we're moving into septic tanks. My whole argument with the water was 
I'm 33. A lot of people my age from my graduating class in high school didn't receive their bachelor's degrees until later on in life because life happens. We have children. We put stuff on hold. We work so we can raise these kids to a certain age so we can go back to school while they're at school. And this is just how life happens. There's nothing wrong with it. And so um, I, put, I put life on hold or work on hold to raise a child. I, I started this, this, it turned into a career because I've seen things along the way. Um, you graduate college, you get this degree, this awesome degree, whether it's teaching. For me, uh, I'm almost done with my, my degree in information technology. Computers, love computers. Secure shell, you know, and all this and that. Could be carpentry, anything. But you get this awesome degree or certificate and you, and, and you want to make this money, but you can't, you know. So when you actually finally start getting a job in your field and you start making money, you're, you're led to believe you have land. Okay, so I'm going to buy a home. That's easy, right? You work on your credit, you get a home, you move in. You move it on your land. How are you supposed to get water? Does anybody tell you where the nearest water connection tap-in is, the tie-in? No. It could be 3,000 feet away. We do water connections up to, I think, 1,000 feet, 1,200 feet. And that's going to run anybody like eight or $9,000 just to trench it, lay the pipe, tap it in. That doesn't, that doesn't, co that doesn't cover the cost of your uh, freezeless riser or your uh, curb stop or your meter pit. All these things going to end. And these are things you don't learn. You know, you just think you're going to buy a house and then you're going to get water. Boom. Well, we found out when we started hooking people up to water that there's people on a waiting list. We gave, we, we gave a, a family a water connection who were on a waiting list for seven years. Can you imagine that? You have a home, a double white. It's your dream house, you know. You put it on a foundation with a crawl space, and then you can't live in it. Or you can if you want, but you have to use an outhouse. You know, you have to haul water, and this is the story. Maybe, maybe some of you l grew up like this or lived like this. Maybe some of you are still living like this. You know, we can help. We can help. We're always, we're always, you know, trying to help our people. The reason why that affects me so much is we moved back to our land. When he, he talked, we moved back to his mom's land in the early 90s. We didn't have water. How long was that? Four years. I, I, I used to get up in the middle of the night, and either him or my mom would take me to the outhouse in the winter. And I was younger then, but I could have swore there was a lot more worse winters back then. It might have been small, but I could have swear snowbanks were up to here. You know, so, yeah. Um, but I grew up like that. And that was in the early 90s. We're, in, we're almost in 2020. Children should not have to be going to the, the outhouse and be okay with it. And that's another story, you know. Um, seeing these little kids get water for the first time, you know. I asked this man, this family, I said, well, how do you bathe your grandchildren? Because he watches his grandchildren. And he'd been on a waiting list for a while, too. And he says, uh, there's a basin, there's a wash basin underneath my front porch. And I've seen it coming into his house. So he took us out to show us again. It's, it's those kind that you would get at like a dollar store. It's a big, remember the kind of giveaway at giveaways? The big rubber basin with rope handles. You, you guys probably know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I fill this up every other night with hot water and cold water and I bathe the kids. I said, man, it's 20, it's at the time it was the year 20, it was last year, it was 2016. Who still bathes their children like that? You know, is that okay? Is that, is that for, our, for our people, should we still be doing that? I think not, you know. We should all be able to take a shower, wash our hands in a sink, or get a pot of water from the sink and make soup. We shouldn't have to go outside and haul water in. Most of us still do that, though. Is there anything wrong with it? No. No, you do what you can to survive. But that's where we, we stepped in to try to help these people like that with food, in kind, and now water. Uh, he talked about we just shoot from the hip. You know, that's what we're doing. But while he was talking, there's things that I normally tell people, and then there's things that I wanted to touch up on. So um, those are the things we do. 
like I said, we're ever changing. So right now, I think we're trying to work on small home repair. We're trying to do. We're, we're trying to write grants for small home repair, uh, septic tanks, and and another thing with that is we don't want to hook a family up to water, and not give them a septic tank, because that's just building up hope. Oh, we give you a, a yard hydrant. You know, you just go outside and get water. You don't have to drive 10 miles to get water anymore. You can just go outside your front porch, get water, and then take it in. Well, how are you supposed to still use the restroom? Okay, so did we just make a problem worse by raising hopes and then leaving? So we don't want to do that. So now we want to work on septic systems because you can't tie a water connection into your home until you have a septic system, a drain field, and this and that. So that's what we're working on now. Fortunately, there's not a whole lot of people we've connected to water who need septic systems. So that's the next step we're taking in that direction. Um, everything we, have, we, we do and offer, there has never been any favoritism. Everything, everybody is eligible. He talked about income. Yeah, there are times when I applied. I'm not, I'm not a rich guy, you know. Um, I'm not, I don't make tons of money doing what I do. But apparently I make enough to where the tribe and other people believe that I don't qualify for certain things. I have two children. I have a wife who works. And so in society's eyes, he's fine. And he'll be all right. In reality, no, we struggle too. Sometimes it's even easier to not even work if you want to live comfortably. But that's not how we should be. We should be, we should be moving forward and helping our people. And so it was through that concept that we don't, there's no favoritism, there's no, you don't have to have a certain eligibility, requ you know, um, financial requirement. You don't have to hit any bars, whether you make 100,000 a year if you're you know, a nurse or a doctor, or if you make 14,000 a year if you're a TANF worker. Anywhere in between that whole entire spectrum, you, you can come get a food box. But like I said, I just put a lot of trust in the people. If you don't need it, don't take it. Because there are, there are others who do need it. I, and we, I wish I could give a food box to everybody. But the cost of shipping them frozen, housing them frozen, the nutritional value. I will not give people General Mills, Lucky Charms. I won't give children soda pop. I don't, that's not the stuff I hand out. I hand out um, frozen fruit, frozen vegetables, turkey, frozen meat. Um, spaghetti sauce, uh, things like that. Th that's the stuff that you would get out of one of our food boxes. Uh, every now and then, like for the holiday boxes, I'll, I'll have my, the guy who packages these things is a good friend of mine over the years uh, for Tower 10 Marketing. His name's Kevin Rutz. He's the one who packages these and, and sends them to us. And I ask him, hey, you know, like for Thanksgiving, I'll try to have him throw in uh, an apron, you know, so the children can wear an apron and help mom around getting the turkey out, baste the turkey. Christmas time, I have him throw in candy canes. Uh, Easter box, I have him throw in jelly beans. This coming year, I'm going to try to have him throw in an um, uh, egg dyeing kit. So the whole issue was, well, Dave, we can't send eggs because they may break. And I said, you don't have to send eggs. You know, they can buy their own eggs. But the dye pack, remember? I can't remember what it's ca called, but comes with little tablets, you know, it's got this little metal thing with the shape like an octa. You guys know what I'm talking about. Put one of those in the food box. You know what I mean? Something these children can look forward to. So everybody's eligible. I never turn anybody away. I've never turned anybody away. Um, only, only when and if they were intoxicated have I, have I turned them away because at that point they just become rowdy. Um, so those... Those are the things that we, we do for the reservation here. Um, I, I have, we have a meeting with, um, it's our new fiscal year, so our new distribution cycle starts in November. I have a meeting coming up at the beginning of November with every head of the nine districts, except ours, because I run Porcupine districts. But every um, district service manager, um, district Councilman, hopefully, not everyone, but at least one district council rep, uh, district representative, and the uh, cap office or the service manager, person who runs the cap um, or service center, 
will come. And uh, those who, I, I invited everybody, but I'm kind of taking it as if, if you don't show on this day, and you've been well informed, but if they don't show that day, then that's a refusal of service because I have to get this stuff out, and, I, and, and I'm not going to give it to a district if they're not going to kick in their 50% of the work. Like I said, everything requires a signature sheet. I can't give a district thousands of dollars worth of in-kind and food if I can't track that I gave you that amount of money within in-kind and food. And so, and this has hit me, this has is, this is bit me in the, in, in, in the, it bit me in the back before. <laughs> because I was taking, people need the stuff, people need the turkeys. Port Pine Ridge District, Ogala District, everybody needs this stuff. And so I was just handing it out on good faith that at the end of the year, you're going to give me all these things. And they didn't. And so I had to toughen up, cut ties there. So that's why I said the past three or four years, there's, there's some districts that didn't get nothing from us. Um, but this year, um, the invites have been sent out. And it's up to the leaders and the heads of these districts to come. And, you know, they were elected for this, these positions. I mean, if you want to receive these services, you got to come out. And I'm not asking you to come to my office for the entire day. We're going to come, talk it over. T I'll tell you the process, what's required of you. You'll be there for not even, no longer than we've been here so far. And that's it. And so um, I hope to work with all nine. I've sent, I've sent them all out there, the other eight. I've gotten call, callbacks from, I think, three or four so far. But... Um, you know, I, I really hope that they come because that's going to, you know, entitles everybody in this reservation to receive services. <coughs> our, our office, if you've ever seen our office, we're very, um, we're very, um, you can come in there and see. And, and I've been accused of this earlier on in this career was, uh, well, what's behind that door? You know, what do you guys got in there? Are you hiding stuff? So we'd open the door and say, go ahead and go look. Everything that I get through there, I s s get rid of it. Because I definitely don't want to have food spoil um, and things like that. If I, if I happen to get an abundance of turkey, which I usually do, I have a, a chest freezer that I'll just throw all the turkeys in there. doesn't mean they're all mine. People come in and I say, you know, we have all these turkeys. You know, would you like to take one? And so I give them out, you know, and thankfully, too, um, there was a couple families in January, this was a few years back, that said, um, we didn't get any food boxes, and it's, you know, we're, we're hurting on money. Um, so I'd say, oh, I got a turkey. You want to take a turkey home? Yeah, you know, because you can cook a turkey and eat a turkey for three or four days. Well, I want three days. I don't know about that fourth day. It might be a little bad by then. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very, we're very transparent in that sense. There's nothing that I keep. Uh, if there is stuff in there, they're more than welcome to take it, you know, uh, if it's not ours. We do have stuff like, you know, saw, saw horses and table saws in there that do belong to us. <laughs> those are ours. You can't take those. But, like, right now I have a pallet of <coughs> pampers and laundry detergent and a few backpacks with school supplies still in them. You know, and a lot of people will come by and say, hey, my child needs a some notepads and stuff. Well, here, here's a backpack. You don't have to keep the backpack, but you can take the stuff out of it. And I do get a lot of calls from people saying, you still have any Pampers? I do, because I try to give everything out, but people at some point just stop taking it. So I put it to the side, and then as the weeks go by, they might come by and ask for stuff, and that's when we give it out. So we're very transparent in that sense. Um, does anybody have any questions about what I've spoken about so far? The in kind, the heat match. Ooh, I didn't really talk about the heat match, did I? Okay, so the previous three years, we've done it from January to March. Uh, I started doing that because what happens in December? What do we all get excited about in December? It's not Christmas. Snow. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So we all spend our entire money to go watch your children play these sports or go to these, these workshops. And then while we're up there, what do we do? We go, to, we go to the stores and put all this stuff on layaway, right? For Christmas. 
for toys. Or we eat, you know. You guys ever try to eat at restaurants during L&I? You're up there for a week. Yeah, you're going to go broke quick. So what happens in January after all that good stuff's over? We're all broke. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what else happens in January? It's cold, right? What do we all get that, do we, that we don't want to pay for? Light bills, propane. And it's even worse. Three years ago, whenever you, know, you needed a minimum of $250 and propane prices were at an all-time high, I think it was, what was it, $5.80 a gallon? Yeah. And so um, that's why I started the heat match program. It's not a whole lot, but it's, it's, it's something. You, know, you have 100 you give me a money order for 100 I'll match you 100 and that's how that started. But it's been getting colder lately. And so I wrote it up this year to where I'm going to start uh, towards the end of November. So I'm going to go a couple months earlier into March. So I might be going for five months. Uh, but we're changing it around this year. You, you're, el you're eligible to use it up to three times. But once per month. So if you want to heat match in November, that's fine. Uh, you can't get it twice in November. You want to do it in December, that's fine. January, that's fine. But you cannot apply February and March. That might be the coldest two months. You know, I'm trying to spread the money around so everybody can utilize this. And maybe some of you have. How many of you have used the heat match program? Share uh, your show of hands. Yeah. And for those of you who haven't, um, you can find these. Out. They're not out yet. Um, but you can find your applications at your district service center or the LEAP office, or um, the tribal office, um, anywhere like that. The Lay Creek Electric will have applications, and you will be able to get an application from um, Lakota Plains Propane. I also work, I will also be working with Nebraska Public Power District, but that might take some time, so you might not see that match happen right away because they're an extremely hard vendor to work with. Um, I used to work with um, Westco, but they don't want to work with us. The reason why is Lakota Plains will give us credit, and Bob's Gas in Martin will give us credit. So they'll, they'll give, you guys give me $100, I'll match it, they'll deliver it. And then I don't pay them until the heat match is over. So then they'll send me a bill for, might be $50,000, ballpark because we just help that many people. So $50,000 is 500 families with a $100 match each. Um, so they'll send me the bill, we cut a check, and we pay them. That's how that works. With NPPD and Lake Creek and, and all that, they want their money now. And uh, with Westco, it was, it was, uh, they were, there wasn't very many people that were using Westco. And so the reason why they didn't want to work with us was because they didn't see it as um, a necessity to come out and do one house and then drive all the way back to Gordon. And then two weeks later, come out again and do one or two houses. They wanted to, well, how about this? For two months, we'll collect all these people and then we'll go out there two months from now and we'll hit them all up. Well, what if that family needed that heat match tomorrow, you know, or at the end of the week? What if they had 15%? Is that going to last two months? No. And so I tried to tell them that. So they just don't want to work at all. So that's why we don't use Westco. So we use four major vendors, Lakota Plains, Propane, Lake Creek Electric, and Bob's Gas and Martin, and then the Nebraska Public Power District. <coughs> we didn't, we had a, I had a hard time working with them because there was no set office. I would call Scott's Bluff, and they'd say, you need to call Alliance. So I'd call Alliance, and then they'd say, you need to call Lincoln. Well, I'd call Lincoln, and they'd say, well, you need to call the office in Omaha. So I call Omaha, and then it, you, know, you got to call the office in Shadron because that's the closest one. I even went out to Shadron's NPPD office. There was nobody in there. It had a nice sign, and I peeked in the door, and there was, there was one little desk with a, a computer and a chair. And there, was, there was no filing cabinet, nothing. It was all just a desk with a computer and a chair. There was nobody in there. There was office hours, but there was nobody in there. And so um, I, I literally had to track who I was going to send the checks to, who, who, who was going to, you know, authorized payments and this and that. Got a pretty good idea of how it's going to go this year. Started working with one single person who I think is their chief financial manager. Um, 
I just didn't want to leave NPPD out because we're, you know, Oglala Sioux Tribe, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, the majority of Pine Ridge uh, Village is NPPD, that sits on NPPD's grid. How can I say we're servicing this Pine Ridge Reservation if we never helped anybody in Pine Ridge? So I worked hard and fought hard to do that, and we're, we're doing it now. Uh, but people would call in and say, that's not fair. You know, we don't have Lake Creek, and I don't use propane. And so uh, now we do. Now, now we service Pine Ridge Village through NPPD on the heat match. So if any of you are from there in this room or listening in, uh, don't worry. You know, throw your heat match in there for NPPD. Now, in terms of fuel oil, that's another thing. I, I don't work with... Um, Pine Ridge Oil anymore because I've done heat matches with them for fuel oil in I believe January and that fuel oil wasn't delivered to those people until June which I, I'm pretty sure that you don't you, you shouldn't need heat by then when it's 95 100 degrees out so I just couldn't trust that because then people get mad at me well I matched with you back in January you know it's not me I turned your stuff in they just never delivered it so I don't, I don't want to be like that. So I don't, I don't do that vendor either. We don't do wood vendors either because it's kind of hard to track quality of wood. So I know people want wood, but, you know, how, how am I going to know if I'm matching $200 to a wood vendor if they just chopped you fresh green wood? It's not going to burn. You're not going to heat your home with it. What they used to do to us when I worked for a rehab back in the day, they used to take a stockpile that wood and they'd come out and um, inspect it, make sure it's quality what they're wanting to see. Yeah. And then um, they would pay us for that wood and then um, send us a ticket of who to deliver it to. That, that seemed to work. I don't know. I don't think they do that anymore, but that's what they yeah. used to do way back. Yeah. And so, see, we can't do something like that because, <laughs> like he mentioned, we're, we're literally, we used to be a two-people operation. Now we're three. Um, all the stuff that I mentioned, it seems like a lot of stuff, man. But you come to our office, it's just three of us sitting in there going crazy most times, especially during the heat match. Yeah. People obviously have um, furnaces that are still using fuel oil. Is there an opportunity for them to um, request a different heating system just to get out of that situation? I'm not sure. If it's hard to get fuel oil? Think, um, the only fuel oil burners that that I'm aware of are the ones that up at OCS and I think at Little Old School. Some oh, of the schools have. So organizations have them rather than homes? Yeah, but not, not, I don't think any individual homeowners have any okay. fuel oil. Uh, little Old used to be fuel oil, but they switched out of it. So I know a lot of the school housings fuel oil in Pine Ridge. Right? Even the CC yards do fuel oil, huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so if there's, uh, there's no any other questions about the services, yeah. Yeah, I just got <coughs> a couple of questions. One is like, the district, you don't know how they choose who gets those food boxes or whatever for anything. And the other question was like, I knew you guys did the $100, what do you call it? You, yeah, and you mentioned Lake Creek. You mean that you could do that with lights too? Or? Well, you can. You can. I, I would prefer you use the match for heat. Um, the reason why I, I allowed, started allowing Lake Creek and, and Nebraska Public Power is because I have a FEMA home. My home is totally electric. I, there's no propane at all. And so my light bills from the month of December to February are upwards of $350 to $400 a month. Now, to me, I've never owned a home other than this one. So that's normal winter months for me. Whenever I start talking to my parents about it, they're like, my God, $400 for your light bill? I'm like, yeah. Why? What do you pay? And, you know, it's like, like at the most, 180 in the winter. It's like, man, I'd love to pay that. <coughs> but I'm not going to, like, leave the furnace off. It's totally electric. And so I would prefer, and I tell this to people, I would prefer you use it for heat because that's what it's written up as. But um, if you want to use it for Lake Creek and, and you, uh, you have propane, I mean, that's, that's up to you. But, um, you know, that's, like I said, it's completely up to you. I mean, if you're sitting there with lights on and you're cold, that was up to you. Yeah. 
And I strongly uh, uh, suggest that you refrain from using space heaters. And uh, um, um, God, what, was I, what else was I going to say? Um, yeah, so I, I do accept those, you know, for Lake Creek as well. I just prefer to use it for heat. But, if, you know, if your house is totally electric, great, you know, because um, it's not fair if you don't have propane, you know, and you need lights to, to heat your home. You were trying to say yeah, something? Um, I was going back to Koshi's question uh, about selections. Uh, no, we don't. When we work with the districts, as I said earlier, um, like all these are district chairmen or the district people, what we give out to the district as each, each district service center, they know their their people, their district. So how they distribute it is up to them. And no, we do not go by any list. I think uh, one spirit does that. I think one spirit yeah. has a list of a selective list that's confidential. Who gets what? But anyway, we don't do that stuff. Ours all out in the open, like you said. Uh, but we trust each cap office, each service center, the ones that are working with us, to make that decision. And uh, that's what when this next uh, week when we're talking to all the service, all the districts, we want to bring those issues up. We want to make sure the council representative, the district chairman, and that service service manager, I think the district service manager, yeah. has to call that. those are the three important people <coughs> in each district. Uh, we want them to know what's going on. This way, we're all on the same page. Uh, a lot of it is trust. Like we said, it's trust. The, they know their, their families. We know what is it, about 180 boxes. Yeah. But we yeah. serve about 180 to 200 families per district, which is that's that's, min that's a minuscule bucket. But yeah. we we we're hoping that at the district level, they know who needs it, who really needs it. That's how that's we're hoping that that's what's how it's going on. It's trust. We trust Medicine Root. We trust uh, all these other districts uh, that they're doing that, and, and that's what we want to enforce when we visit with them. The other thing, I, the other thing I do too to, to kind of like add on to that was um, I receive these signature sheets per district, so I I compare from December's sheet, November's sheet. January sheet, and then I tell the district, you, you know, you gave this, this, these people, you, you've already done these people. Do you know these people? And they say, yeah. They're usually like the first few on the list. Well, well, tell them that you've received it in the past. You know, I know I, I know I always put first come, first serve, but that's not always the case whenever the people who are always first coming to be served are the only ones with cars, and there are those who are trying to catch a ride. So like, I, like we said, I put a lot of trust in the district people on that level to, to know your people, to know your people and, and who needs it the most. And there's always that issue, and I, and I get this a lot every year, year after year. Well, they're only helping their family. Well, and I, and I put that trust in them too, and I tell them, you know, I know you have family. Maybe your family's huge, but you also know your people in your district. Like, you know, I'm getting these complaints, you know, and this keeps happening. I will stop this, literally. I put somebody else in charge, and if, and if they can't handle it, then I, I, like I said, I've taken it away from districts. And who's to blame? It's not me. You know, if you're not helping your people, which these people got chosen to be in these positions to help, then what are we doing? And so there's no blame on any part for anybody from me because, like I said, I trust everybody in these districts. And so people, people yeah. will talk out of spite. You might have been the 181st person in line, and we only had 180 boxes. Well, you're the first person who's going to be told, "You, sorry, you know, you sh we ran out. And so a lot of people will just be mad and call me and say, they're only helping these amount of people. Well, yeah, you know, if I, if I had a warehouse that was super huge that had 20,000 food boxes in it, then I would give, you know, five, 6,000 food boxes per district. I can't do that, you know. I have a warehouse that can only hold. Well, we've expanded it, so I think we can do a little over a thousand food boxes now. But still, I mean, we're doing a thousand food boxes. We used to do 800, so 200 more is a step up. But we're expanding, we're growing, and so things like this take time. 
And so I want to help more people, but that's just how I approach that situation is you know the people in your district. You know who needs it. So help them. And so, um, yeah, we put a lot of trust in it. And you're going you're gonna to eventually have to tell somebody, we ran out, you, you know, and it sucks. It, it, it's a hard thing to do, but, man, like I said, I've been doing it for eight years now, so it got pretty easy. And uh, people used to call and chew me out, cuss me out, and, you know, call me names. But, like I said, I've never held anything back. I never put anything to the side. The only time that I would allow food boxes to be put aside and saved is if you had volunteers. So, like, I have people who come in and, and, and volunteer. This is before I had my loading dock. I needed to help pulling chains to get the, you know, the trailer unloaded with all these pallets. And I can't pay, I'm a, we're a nonprofit. I can't pay you, you know. I can give you an honorarium or a stipend, but you're gonna wait like three weeks for that to get processed and a check mailed. Or do you just wanna take like three food boxes home with you? Yeah, I need food. So I'm gonna help you out and take three. So that's the only time I would let, allow them to put food boxes aside was that. Yeah. Since we only have a few minutes left before we begin with uh, the panel discussion at noon, I wondered if you could touch on the scholarship program. Which one? All of them, or or briefly on um, on the whole program, because I wasn't aware of it till I looked at your website, and I thought it was phenomenal. The Dream Starter, the Dream Starter program. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I was like scholarship program. I don't know if we, I don't know if we gave out scholarships. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's why I was asking questions, because that's the last thing I wanted to, to touch on was the Dream Starter program. Okay, so back about 2014, Billy Mills wanted to give back for his, because 2014 was 50 years that he won his gold medal. And so he wanted to give out uh, 50 um, to 50 youth. And to, a youth for us was the age of 14 to 30 can apply for this Dream Starter grant program. It's a grant. And um, um, the year one was wellness. And I believe we had one person from Pine Ridge Reservation uh, was accepted, and it's James Pine. Uh, he did, he's the one who went around to all these districts and did running camps for the youth. And uh, from the age of 14 to 30, you can apply. If you are selected, you are given a $10,000 grant for the fiscal year. Um, this year, currently, right now, the grant application process is open since October 14th. So you have until from October 14th to December 16th to apply for this. Anybody between the ages of 14 to 30 at the time of application. Um, what do you need? Um, you apply, you, you, you hook up with a sponsor, a 501c3 program. Now, we've been asked, can that be running strong? Can you be our sponsor? Uh, I think the issue there was a little gray and fuzzy. I can't remember exactly if we could actually be the sponsor since we're the ones who are doing the granting. Um, but it doesn't have to be a 501c3. It can be a school. As long as the school services at least one Native American community. So, um, you know, a lot of our schools here do. And uh, we've been put, putting the word out. You know, everybody from this district or this reservation apply. Or even if you're from Rapid, apply, you know, because you can always find a sponsor. <laughs> and so if you're selected, you're given a $10,000 grant to uh, kind of come up with a program to help the youth in your area. Uh, this year, I believe it's um, science and, in, and the environment. Uh, back in 2014 to 2015, it was wellness. That was physical wellness. We had a lot of good ones there. Uh, 2015 to 16 was oh, arts and crafts. So that's, you know, we had a lot of people who were doing powwow clubs or regalia making or canoe making, you know. Th and these are people accepted all over the United, continental United States and Hawaii and Alaska. And so we had people who were doing um, stick game, stick game, um, I can't remember what it's called. But um, he wanted to revitalize a stick game for his people and we, he got chosen, we chose him and he did a really good job. And... A lot of this helps them to, um, this, this grant is for the year, but it's, it's, in this process you learn to 
go past what that grant is and how to apply for further grant funds through other organizations other than Running Strong. And so I believe there's a really good one in Bismarck, Darius Sparks. He's a hunkpapa from Standing Rock. He still he's he was a year two, oh no, year one recipient, and it's now year four, and he still does his basketball camps. As a matter of fact, he raised enough money to where he's starting to do for females now, so he has you know he can afford to pay a female coach to do these camps with him because before that he was still building, and he he didn't have money to afford it, so now he's doing co-ed basketball camps, and so these are just the things that they they're furthering on. And um, um, uh, so, yeah, that's our, our grant application process is open now. Uh, let me see here, 14:30. Yeah. We, we have supply. Did you bring, didn't you bring some yes. handouts? Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, okay. We have some. We have our Dream Starter Grant program, and I suggest you pick one of these up if you're interested, or if you know anybody between the ages of 14 to 30 who you think would be great. And we're always looking for people, especially from Pine Ridge. Uh, we've been plugging and plugging, but the past couple years we've had very minimum applications, if any, from Pine Ridge. <coughs> um, it's not hard. You just fill out an application, and if we like your idea and you're chosen, we grant you the money. We fly you out to Virginia, to Washington, D.C. You meet Billy. You and your sponsor are there. We'll give you tips on how to publicly speak. It's a big thing, you know, uh, if you're doing, you know, run a grant, you should, I feel like public speaking is something everybody should learn how to do. Um, but we, t we teach you these things, we show you the sites. Uh, I think in the past we've gifted uh, Dream Starter recipients with iPads, uh, laptops, and things like that, things that they can be able to take that home and track their budget, their grant budget, and things like that, and how to email it back to us, write reports, monthly reports on how your grant's going. And so, um, yeah, we, we take you out for that week, show you Washington, D.C., give you these tools necessary to run your grant, and then we'll let you go. And all we want is a report. How's your funding going? You know, what's, are you sticking to it? And uh, at the end of the year, it's done. And then it's up to the, the grant recipient, Dream Starter recipient, to uh, further that, which a lot of them have done. Some of them are still doing their projects now, so they're grant period had ended and uh, that's one thing that we encourage them to do you know because all at the end of the day it's the youth that you're doing this for and it's really impacting a lot of the youth so yeah that's the dream starter grant program we also have a teacher dream starter grant program um, I cannot remember off the top of my head what the eligibility requirements are for there but if you were I think it's 100 or is it 50 I can't remember um, but the teachers would receive a $1,000 grant to be used for uh, activities, school supplies, um, uh, field trips, or whatever the teacher might need. Um, my wife is a teacher, and I often find that she spends a lot of our money buying stuff like beanbag chairs, uh, books, uh, curriculum books. And uh, I thought was, there's no joke until she's actually started teaching and we're buying like 40 packs of crayons. Um, so yeah, it's things like that. And I told her, I said, you know, just because I work there doesn't mean you can't apply, because I'm not part of the the selection process. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have a teacher Dream Starter grant program as well. So if you guys know elementary school teachers or people like that, you can have them jump on IndianYouth.org and you can apply straight on there, you know. And so I have handouts for that. Please feel free to take one. I have another booklet about the Dream Starter grant. Um, take that. I have these things. These are really cool. Bracelets. Um, please take one of those. Um, take a t-shirt. He'll have to tell you what sizes they are. And a business card. Like I said, now you guys know who we are. Maybe you can tell other people what it is we do. <coughs> because I feel it's really uncomfortable that we do it. You know, because we're not about being put on a spotlight or being put on a pedestal. We're really unspoken, unspoken about what we do. I don't want to say heroes, but you know, we, like I said, we do water connections. We're working on other things, septic systems. We're, tr you know, renewable energy is in a talks. Nothing's solidified yet. Um, 
small home repair, uh, food, nutritional food, and in-kind things for the children. Everything's geared toward the children. So that's, that's who we are, running strong for Native American youth. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, <coughs> you know, the, the vision at OLC is um, rebuilding the Lakota Nation through education. And of course, we align ourselves with that. But we also walk the talk, okay? And um, by doing so, we bring in, and it's not just about books, although I promote books, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's working together, getting to know each other, and sharing information. Um, today, um, I did. I, I gathered up a couple batches of books because we do the Build Your Own Library program, where we try to start libraries in every child's home, for every child. And um, I want these to go over to the office, and the children can um, can have access to them, and then they also know they're from Wokesapi Tipi from the from the library. And so there's two batches of books. Many of them are English and Lakota. And our Build Your Own Library program is run by donations and primarily gears towards children. Um, we would like to thank you again um, to the staff of Running Strong in the office. We would like to give this large mug. They could put pencils in it or somebody can bring coffee out of it. And, uh, son, I know you're always running around, so everybody likes these things. And, um, Mr. Lono, I thank you so much. And we got you a jacket. And, um, we just... her quote she gave it. She gave it to me. You're so welcome, and thank you. I just want to take a little opportunity here to mention that who doesn't want to work with their father, right? He tried to retire many times, and um, I told him that we need to get this water program going. People need water. My whole ideology behind that was i got to keep him around. And so that's the reason why he's in charge of the water connection program. This is, I just like having him around. He's good, he's good counsel, you know, he's been doing this for decades before me. And so um, he's, the, he's the water technician guy. He's the one, oh, uh, not technician, water coordinator. So like I said, you need water, you can talk to me, but I'm just going to refer you to him because I made him in charge of that. Yeah. Ask Mr. Brokenos to do the meal prayer. <clears throat> just this it, just this it. <clears throat> We're all Christianized, so every time when somebody wants to pray, they all stand up. Lakota <laughs> traditional, we sat down and we pray. Because we're part of the Ujimaka, the universe. So we sat down and we pray. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I will take a little yacht on Gob, take it Luak and Lupeshuta. Or it's his own car, woe you, sir, and a woe about the Zoki talk, then a Hesh Agia Unchonte etan, no Unasulaki etan. Hesh a woe you, sir, says he no pink air, Hesh a woe take, and I church it. Or Hunt on Kaho Hesh, we channel the woman and all the shit gets here. Look how we channel here at Doki of Water Grey, or we are picking on a woe take a little head care hoy and make it seem to a woe take a little eagle like a picked on her eighty hectare, a metaki of a monkey competition, or a cranza and a open kitchen dinner. How will take care of money picked the air heads a woe take a little yard to carpet for metaki?